Hello, I'm Patricia with Buzz and Bark Animal Reiki, and today, instead of doing the normal um, card readings for your pet, I'm going to talk a little bit about what animal communication is and how it works, because it is a fascinating interspecies communication. Now, I majored in communications for humans, so I have a background in journalism and also radio, and I've done podcasts, I've done videos, I've done a lot of things for humans. So going into interspecies communication, which is sort of the um, tip of the iceberg, or however you want to say that, but I feel like since my childhood, I have wanted to be an animal communicator. And when I was a child, I wanted to be a vet. I just loved animals. I wanted to do something with animals. I used to walk, or not walk people's dogs, I used to take care of people's animals when they went on vacation. I used to rescue animals. I mean, I did a lot of things when I was a child in regard to animals. And I forgot about it as I became an adult and then I became a journalist and um, did astrology and all these other things which were more human-centered. And it wasn't until I was fostering a German short hair pointer named Sabaka that I had that calling or that reminder of the calling that I had when I was a child, which was to engage in the inner species communication <clears throat> or just the connection that I had felt as a child was all of a sudden coming back. But then I had that fear that a lot of people have when you think of starting a business or when you want to do something that's a little bit unusual and off the beaten track was don't I have to get certified who's going to take me seriously so even though I already had the skills and I already had the passion for it I did get certified I did take some classes and I learned the ethics and I was able to get insurance and you know do all the things that you can do when you have the certification that you might not be able to do if you don't and for people wanting to study animal communication, there are so many different teachers out there. There are so many different ways you can learn it. I mean, you can learn it locally from another animal communicator, or you could go with a famous person that does it online, or, you know, it doesn't matter which route you take as long as you get the basic skills and that you have the set of codes and ethics that you apply when you're working with both the people and the animals because you don't want to insult the client you know, when you're communicating with your animal and there are certain things that you don't do as an animal communicator and it's it's tough because we could be walking down the street and a dog passes by us and wants to communicate with us but without the permission of the guardian of that dog, we really, it's kind of unethical to do that. Now sometimes animals will communicate to us and we don't really have a lot of control over it. You know, it's just they know that we're an open channel, they know that that door is open, and sometimes they go through that door. Now the other thing that some animal communicators do, including me, is we are spiritual mediums. So before I ever became an animal communicator, I was already talking to spirits. And I also spent many years working with totem animals and spirit animals. Um, helping um, clients get connected with their spirit animal and I worked with crow spirit for a long time and crow is an intermediary in that they can communicate for other species so they can also be very prophetic and tell you things like oh the dog is sick or the cat's having problems you know they may be a little bit gossipy and tell you things that maybe the other animals don't want you to know so it is a kind of a weird esoteric field and there are still some people who do not take it seriously. There are some vets who will not work with animal communicators. And then there are some vets that are open to it. Um, but the thing about being an animal communicator is you cannot diagnose, prescribe, or do anything that a vet can do. What you can do as an animal communicator is if you feel a burning sensation on the right side of the animal, you can convey that. You can't diagnose it or say what you think it is or your theories. All you can do is say, I'm feeling heat on the left side of the body. You might want to get that checked out by a vet. Now in some places, and I know this is with Reiki, I'm not sure with animal com communication, you have to have permission from a vet to have your animal work with a Reiki practitioner. I, I don't know, if, I don't think it's that way where I am now, but there are some places in the world where it's very strict. And I don't know if that's a conspiracy against 
animal communicators or if it's just because they're just trying to keep everything scientific. Now, can animal communication be proven scientifically? I don't think it can be, but there are some good documentaries and there are some researchers, animal researchers and behaviorists who have worked with animal communicators and even learned how to do animal communication. So it is being taken more seriously and it is very effective. So if an animal is going through a transition and you're up in arms about it, like you just can't handle like bringing a new animal into your house, it's just not working out, don't take the animal back to the shelter until you've worked with an animal communicator or somebody doing Reiki or some other kind of energy work because that animal's having a hard time adjusting and they need to be validated. They need to be listened to. And if you're gonna go through all the trouble of bringing an animal into your house, then you obviously do have the funds, or I'm thinking you have the funds to work with an animal communicator. It could be a one-time session or it could be a series of sessions. You could ask for maybe a price difference if you're going to do six sessions as opposed to one session. I know that I will work out a deal with people if they're going to do more than one session. And also know that one session might do the trick, but most of the time it's not because the animal is now open to communication and we want to also see the progress that's being made. So instead of coming in every week, they could be once a month for maybe six months and then you can see the progress that's being made and a lot of the times it just seems miraculous. But what's happening is the animal's being heard. And when the animal's being heard and then certain adjustments are being made on the part of the human, then the animal is more likely to change. So let me give you a story about, um, well, I'm not gonna say names, but there was a cat that was biting the heels of her person. Right, And then the person wanted to know, why does a cat bite me in my sleep? Why does a cat keep biting my feet? Well, it turns out that the cat was trying to help the person get grounded. So the cat wasn't doing it to be vicious, although, I mean, having your feet bleed and the pain of being bitten by a cat is not much fun. But the cat was actually trying to make the point that the person needed to be grounded. So when the person became indecisive and was kind of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on a topic, the cat would bite them on the feet. And so when I mentioned that to the person, they said, oh, that's true, I do do that. So then they made the effort to be more decisive and to work on their their things. And then that cat actually stopped biting them. And so a lot of the times there's this bond between humans and animals and animals don't have that many ways of communicating. They'll use body language, they will use biting and scratching and you know different things like that if they're not being heard in any other way. And most of the times, unless the animal's completely afflicted or traumatized in some way, they are trying to help the human. They're trying to help the human be a better human. And that can sometimes look like they're the ones with the behavior problem. And so people will go to an animal communicator or maybe a dog trainer or whoever it is they go to and they'll say, well, I have a problem with my dog. My dog has this behavioral problem. But when you really drill down, what's happening is it's not, it's a combination of the human and the dog. Now the human needs to take responsibility for their end and then by working with the animal and communicating and bonding with that animal, you can end up with a much better relationship. So say somebody does get a dog from a shelter and the dog's just not making it in the house. Like maybe they're, um, maybe they're going to the bathroom in the house. Maybe they're chewing on things. Maybe they're fighting with the other animals in the house or maybe the other animals are bullying them because of the territory that hasn't been sorted out. And so by hiring an animal communicator or even a, a Reiki practitioner or you know the different, again, there's different energy modalities out there. Uh, cranial sacral has been used on animals as well. So kind of working and clearing up that aura and, 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 and being a good listener. Uh, and sometimes you have to even communicate with the other animals in the household. So sometimes if there's one particular animal that's bullying the new animal, then that particular animal needs to also be addressed. Not in the same session, you'd have to do different sessions. A lot of these sessions can be done in 10 minutes sometimes 30 minutes, usually it's not longer than that. Usually the first 30 minutes of a session is intake. It's talking about the animal and trying to figure out what's going on. And then there's the actual session. So for myself, I need that time, five or 10 minutes to actually get myself into a trance. 
and then I once I'm in that trance I'm actually speaking to the spirit of the animal I'm I'm using telepathy now telepathy is a gift that all humans have but we stopped using them hundreds of years ago we have a lot of parts of our brains that we don't use and I remember hearing something that humans use 10% of their brain well animals use most of their brains so when you have a dog their sense of smell is probably their their most important um, and, and then if they're a sight hound then their sight and um, the hearing all these things that they have that are extrasensory and then you have the horse that has its intuition and its way of going about the world and then you have all the animals with their special attributes of how they are able to communicate and then you have the interspecies connection where or even um, within a species where you've got the geese that are flying across the country in a tandem and there's this energy field that they're all connected to so when an animal communicator is tapping into especially wild animals they are tapping into that energy field that contains all of us but the thing the difference between the humans and the animals is that we have disconnected from the energy field the animals are part of that energy field so if there's an earthquake coming if there's a volcanic eruption if there's something coming they know ahead of time it's coming because they're connected to that that collective energy field and so are we but we're we're unconscious to it so the more that I've worked with animal communication, the more I've gone into this telepathy, this telepathy and the more I've connected with the spirits of animals and plants, the more I am engaging with that field that we're all connected to. And it might even be the field of um, that Rumi had talked about in his poems where I'll meet you in the, the field of I don't know, I like to think of it as quantum physics because I do use a lot of quantum physics and I believe strongly in quantum physics whether I'm using Reiki or whether I'm using uh, animal communication I believe in timelines I believe we can jump timelines I believe that nothing is solid so if you think a certain thing is going to happen a certain way it may not happen that way depending on where your frequency is at any given time and you know animals have that awareness of frequency they know when there's a bad vibe like if you bring an animal into a room where somebody's just had a fight or maybe there's some kind of danger lurking in the future there animals know and you can look at their body language they may start trembling they may start showing some signs of anxiety and you're looking around and you can't figure out what they're so anxious about but those are red flags and they're actually helping you to be alert as well so you might be walking down a street and all of a sudden it starts feeling creepy and you notice that your animal, your dog is acting a certain way like it doesn't want to be there. And that's a good sign to get out of there before something really bad happens. So that's kind of how the animal communication works. It's very in depth and it, there's so many things we can talk about in these videos. So any topic that you would like to see, just put it down in the comments and I'll address it the best that I can. If there's any particular breed that you would like to um, discuss or any particular animal and, and maybe what their worldview is, I mean, obviously, as individuals are gonna have a different worldview than their collective um, thing, but dogs definitely have their worldview and cats have a worldview and horses and lizards, there's, there's a different reality. So we think that as humans, we think there's only one reality. We think it's our reality. And we have all these assumptions that our animals are thinking exactly the way we're thinking and they're not and they don't see the world in the way we are we're on two legs we're taller you know we're seeing the world more um, vertical they're seeing the world more horizontal especially if you're and they're more grounded because if you've got four legs and animals also have and we do have feet chakras as well but we probably don't pay as much attention to them um, animals have um, chakras in their paws and they have chakras in their ears and I think humans do as well but you just don't hear about it as much and we don't use them as much like we unless we're walking around barefoot we're probably not using our feet chakras so when you're inside and you can feel the sensations on the bottom of your foot and you know and you can also use um, you know tuning forks in different ways to clear those chakras on your feet so you can be more grounded and you can do that with animals as well you can help them like if they've had a, a rough time you can work on all their chakras using tuning forks provided they don't mind the sound of the tuning forks now some animals will run away from tuning forks because they don't like the frequencies 
and I seem to think, I mean, it's kind of weird, but they seem to like the higher ones and they don't like the lower ones. So I tried to use the 174 Hertz and there was one dog that didn't like it and there was one cat that really couldn't stand it. And then I would use the 963 and all the animals seemed to be okay with the 963 Hertz, which is one of the missing solfeggio tones. So you have to kind of experiment a little bit. So my, my animal communication does involve Reiki sometimes and sound therapy and sometimes I will work with crystals if I feel like there's a blockage. I do work with the, um, with the Reiki, I work with meridians, and I work with the chakras mainly, but I also feel around uh, energetically where there might be a blockage in, in the body. And then I ask the person to go and have that checked out with a vet to make sure that that animal doesn't have a serious health condition. Um, but even if they do, the Reiki is never going to hurt them. It's only going to act as an adjunct therapy to whatever the vet is recommending. So those are my thoughts for the week. I am going to try to make more of these videos. I just rented an office space and it's, I still I haven't got it set up right. I, I don't want that white wall behind me. I'm trying to put that cloth out there, but it doesn't seem to be lining up with the computer the way I want it to. But I hope you enjoyed this. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, please subscribe. This video will also be on LinkedIn. And I hope you enjoy it. And uh, go and uh, bless your animals and give them all the love they need because they're not going to be with you for very long. And you want it to be a quality time. I mean, some animals last six, seven years. Some can go, like a parrot can go for eight years or, or more. But it depends on the type of animal that you have. Um, but even if it is a long life together, it's a commitment. So if you have a horse or you have a tropical bird, that's a commitment. That's a lifelong companion. I mean, if you're going to live into your 80s or however long you're going to live and, you know, that animal's probably going to outlive you. Horses can live 30 years, or probably more. They can live a really long time. So depending on what kind of animal you have, um, just know that, make a commitment to them. and. Also, you might even do a little ceremony with them if you're open to it, kind of like a, a commitment, you know, like if two people get married or whatever, they make that commitment to each other, but you can make a more like a human animal bond commitment, uh, which is different, of course, than a human to human one, but that you'll be there for them, that you'll support them in the good times and the bad times, whether they're sick or whether they're well, that you're going to be there for them. So hopefully that will be um, something you can do with your pet. So thank you and have a wonderful week. And remember, this is Buzz and Bark Animal Reiki and I do animal communication, Reiki, and sound therapy. Have a wonderful day.